Determine the force P on the cable if the spring is compressed a quarter of an inch, 0 0.25 inch. When the mechanism is in the position shown, the spring has a stiffness and it's given to be 4,800 pounds per foot. And the answer is, is P needs to be 141 pounds. That's the answer. But let's take a look. Where is the force P? Well, it's downward pulling on the cable out here. Okay. We look at the, where's my spring? My spring is down here. And, oh, they showed me a K, a lowercase k. Isn't that my stiffness? They didn't put the numeric value down there, but it's 4,800 pounds per foot. Okay. What is the rest of this? This is a hard support, and it looks like the spring wraps around the rod, and the rod goes out here and connects, and maybe there's a washer. If the spring is compressed, which direction does the spring exert a force on that blue member coming down? That's the first hard question. If the spring is compressed, it exerts a force that direction on my member. Okay, very good. That's a hard one to see for some students, but hopefully everybody gets that. Maybe you take a little more time than other students, but there you go. Now we look at this frame, and it's uh, supported at a, by a pin at C and supported by a pin at A. And how many members, individual members, does it have? It looks like it has a member going from A to B down to this E. That would be member one, the longest, most complicated member. Has a member B to D to, out to where the p load is applied, P at the end. And then it has a member C to D this way. It has three internal members. So after you read the problem a few times over, it says, what am I asked to find? I'm asked to, to find just one answer, P, the, the downward pull force in the cable. You probably want to make a free body diagram of the entire frame. Replace here by some A and the X, A and the Y. Then I have C and the X, C and the Y. And then this spring force I'm going to replace so that there's just a, a force there. That would be my first cut at a free body diagram for the entire system. And I may come in here and I may label things, and I call this one the force in the spring. And this is AY and AX. And this would be CY uh, and CX. Okay. I can actually calculate the magnitude of the force in the spring. Uh, that was Hooke's Law, wasn't it? K times either the stretch or the compression. And so I'm going to say, okay, sometimes I use S for stretch, C for compression, or just X for the, the change in the length of the spring. And we know it's in compression, so it's going to be the stiffness, 4,800 pounds per foot, and then 0.25 inches, and then we need a conversion factor. A foot is 12 inches. 100 pounds. Now, I can do this counting and I can say I have one, two, three, four, five unknowns. This is a 2D problem. I can do my equations of equilibrium, some of the moments about a particular point, some of the forces in X, some of the forces in the Y. All day and all night, I'll have three equations, five unknowns. It's not going to happen. I must get free body diagrams of the members. I must decompose it. So the simplest member is a member C to D. So let's go ahead and decompose, and I'll just try to draw it over there. There's member C to D. And then I'm going to try and draw a member A to B. Draw the member B to D out like that. This is the same, CX and CY. But right up here, what do we have at D? Do we have uh, DX and DY? Yeah, and at this point, there's a section of the textbook that's really important in the previous chapter. What is the title of section 5-4? Read that out loud again. Two and three force members. Two and three force members. 
when you look at this member, C to D, is it a two-force member? That's a big conclusion. Do I have CX and CY and DX and DY? Do I really have four unknowns? What do we know about two force members? Pin connected at the ends. They're either in tension or compression. CX and CY are not independent, are they? They have to be in the right proportion such that the, the force at C, its line of action goes straight through point D. So what we do is we say, aha, now I observe that this is a two-force member. I really do need to change my description of the support at C and the support at the pin at D. So if it's in compression, when I cut this member free from the surrounding, the surrounding is going to exert a force force in member C to D, and it'll be at point C, and its line of action will take it right through point D. Likewise, when I come up here, this is the force, but it has the opposite direction, and it has the same magnitude, F, C to D. We did this for the trusses. Trusses were all pin-connected two force members. This is just a pin connected to force member as part of a larger frame. So here we're going to assume it's in compression so that when I come out here to this member and there's point D, I would put right here with the right angle or the right slope, I would put the force in C to D in that direction. Wouldn't that be consistent? And so this is also P down. And uh, I have to worry about B here in a minute. Right here is B, and this is my AX, and this is my AY, and this is my force in the spring. Maybe I clean those up a little bit. Let me draw that like this. This is one of those times where you do need to go back, and you need to modify your free body diagram of the entire system right here. And you need to come in, and you need to put a single force right there, compression force in member C to D. Most times, you want to resist the temptation to modify it. But what we did was we didn't observe that we had a two-force member, C to D, until we got into the problem. And we really need to exploit that. We need to use that information. This becomes a trivial uh, free body diagram for the member C to D. It's the member A, B, E is pretty complicated, and the member... B to D is still pretty complicated. Let's talk a little bit about the member B to D. What is unique about this member B to D? I have pin connected at B. I haven't put in those BX and BY. Maybe I could put that in. Maybe I put in, I don't know, BX, and then I put a BY, and then I come over here, and I'll have a negative BX, and I'll have a negative BY. Now it's consistent. Just like we made some observations about this member C to D, we need to make some observations about the member B to D. What can you observe about the member B to D? It's a three-force member. Section 5-4 is really important. Read that. It talks about two-force members and three-force members. Now what's unique about a three-force member? The force system on a three-force member is either parallel or concurrent. This is not a parallel force system, is it? So the line of action of P and the line of action of this force C to D, those two forces only meet at one point. Guess what the third force has to do? Has to meet at the same point. Otherwise, it's not a concurrent force system. That member will never be in equilibrium unless it's a concurrent force system because it's definitely not a parallel force system. When I do that, I kind of draw the line of action from B to that point of intersection. Then BX and BY are not independent, are they? Go back and we modify that free body diagram. And if you do the sum of the forces in the XP is straight down, isn't it? 
how about the force C to D? We're pretty sure that's in the right direction. It's in compression. It's pushing that member B to D up and to the right. So guess what? Uh, this force over here needs to be down and to the left, doesn't it? Single magnitude, let's say B. Okay, then we come back to this free body diagram. Sorry about that, had to erase a bunch. And we have the same line of action that we have to abide by. And then uh, this member feels a, uh, a uh, equal opposite. We did a lot of work to get some pretty clean free body diagrams and our free body diagrams exploited the use of two force and three force members. I'm going to click to another slide. This is a three force member. This is the point where all of the force systems go through. So it's a concurrent force system. From the information that we had, this angle right here, can you see that from your illustration? What is that? That's 30 degrees, isn't it? Right. And this distance was four inches? Inches. Okay. Here is a right triangle. We would like to calculate the vertical distance from here to here, that distance. Uh, I'm going to pause. I want you to calculate that distance. Okay, give it to me slow. 2.31 inches. inches. So it's 2.3094. I want more digits because we're going to need that number in a minute. Now that we have that triangle, look at this other triangle right here which is, I'll try and draw it down here, goes this distance up and across. And this distance, wasn't it six inches here? Six and four make it 10 inches on the horizontal. The rise is 2.3094. And what we want is this interior angle right there. Let's call it theta. What is that angle? Thirteen point zero zero four degrees. This other member, A to B to E, this is the force in the spring. We do know that. We do know this angle of B, that was uh, 13 degrees, 13.004 degrees, okay? All right, so if you want all those digits. And we have this AX and AY. I have an unknown, an unknown, and an unknown. This is known. How would you solve for B? Let's do the sum of the moments around point A. They must equal to zero. So we'll pick off B, the cosine of that 13 degrees. Moment arm distance is six inches. That makes it want to rotate in the counterclockwise. And then we're going to take the same force B, but the sine of 13 degrees. This moment arm distance is also just happens to be six inches. Six inches here, six inches there. It's equal to the force in the spring. I didn't leave enough room. Let me move this over. And it makes it want to rotate in the clockwise with a moment arm of 24 plus 6, 30 inches. Finally, I have one equation, one unknown. B is equal to 100 times 30 divided by 6 times cosine of 13 plus the sine of 13. 416.927 pounds. 416.927. So there you go. We solve for B. Come back to this free body diagram. We just solved for B, right? How do I solve for the force C to D? Do the sum of the forces and the X equal to zero. So force C to D, cosine of 30 degrees, is equal to B, what we just calculated, times the cosine of the 13 degrees. And we calculate force C to D is equal to 
469 pound. Now we can finally solve for P, sum of the forces in the Y equal to zero. So P is down B times the sine of 13 degrees, that's also downward, and that's equal to the force uh, C to D times the sine of 30 degrees upward. We can now solve for P, 141 pounds. What's the key to in this problem? Observe that this is a two-force member and observe that this is a three-force member and it has to have a concurrent force system. Then it's pretty straightforward. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you. Have a safe spring break.